My name is Richard Hondal. I'm going to introduce next speaker, which is uh, Jenan Brusesson. Uh, we are a little bit delayed, uh, some 15 minutes or so on, so I'll give that introduction short. But Bru Jenan is a Swedish Norwegian hybrid, and we are very happy to have you here in uh, have you in Karolinska. You've done a fantastic uh, work, very focused on cytotoxic T cells, NK cells, and you have your recent data presenting here. So we're really happy to have you here. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the first time I've been introduced to Swedish, so I'm very grateful for <laughs> for being <laughs> accepted finally. But I'm I'm actually Tanzanian American, so um, that's that's a different story. Anyway, first of all, I'd really like to congratulate uh, Dan today uh, for his fantastic scientific achievements. But I think you've also really been a tremendous inspiration for a whole generation of young scientists as well, with with your enthusiasm and and um, really willingness to to share ideas. Um, and then second of all, thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, I'll be uh, focusing, uh, a bit like Claudia, uh, a lot on intracellular processes. Uh, what you see here is an image of a cytotoxic lymphocyte with um, uh, lysosomes that contain uh, these cytotoxic proteins uh, that are released towards target cells and, and mediate target cell killing. And this is a process I've been interested in for many years uh, and which has a clear uh, association to uh, hyperinflammatory uh, syndromes. And, and I haven't used the word autoinflammatory. Uh, these are typically not included in, in, in uh, that realm of diseases as these, uh, one believes, often really require a pathogen trigger. So, so hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, lymphio uh, or HLH for short, is an early onset life-threatening syndrome. Uh, it's characterized by systemic inflammation, uh, typically triggered by, uh, by infections, and, and uh, EBV is, is one such major infection. Um, it's a disproportionate immune response uh, where one has uh, some parts of the immune system working but not the, uh, the CD8 T cell killing. So one sees uh, really uh, hemophagocytosis uh, by hyperactivated organ infiltrating macrophages and large CD8 T cell expansions. And this was this kind of clinical phenotype was first described in 1939 by Bodley Scott and Rob Smith uh, as histiocytic medullary uh, reticular disease. And in 1952, uh, two Scottish uh, clinicians, Far Farquhar and Clareau, described uh, two infant siblings uh, that presented with, uh, with uh, this uh, syndrome with a fatal outcome, really uh, highlighting a, a potential um, genetic uh, um, linkage. Um, and uh, these days, uh, HLH is typically um, defined by meeting five out of eight uh, criteria for, for hyperinflammation. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the literature what this should be called, uh, HLH or, or macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, basically, I think what one can agree on that is too much inflammation and where uh, really um, radical immune suppression is required despite of often having, having uh, severe infections. So, as I mentioned, we've been interested in, in this process of how um, target cells are recognized and how target cells are killed. And uh, the, the field of HLH and, and clinicians have really uncovered a lot of genes uh, required uh, for uh, for lymphocyte cytotoxicity and, and associated with familial HLH. And, and Geneviève de saint basile in Paris is, is really one of the foremost uh, pioneers in, in this field. Uh, first showing that perforin uh, deficiency uh, is associated with HLH and then describing a, a set of other um, genes where loss of function mutations uh, cause uh, defective lymphocyte exocytosis. And basically these are uh, homologous to the proteins that mediate a neurotransmitter release uh, in neurons, uh, where uh, they form snare complexes that drive membrane fusion. 
And uh, yeah, so it's autosomal recessive mutations. And what should also be mentioned here is that these uh, don't all, only cause defects in release of perforin, uh, but really widely affect hemopoietic cells, uh, really um, abrogating exocytosis by platelets, mast cells, neutrophils. But the clinical phenotype uh, really, uh, to a vast extent, mimics perforin deficiency, which is uh, specific to the cytotoxic lymphocytes. So, one, one interest we had in terms of the uh, uh, cell biology of this is uh, which R snare, so which vesicular snare here teams up with the plasma membrane snares to facilitate this vesicle fusion process because as we know from the central nervous system, uh, one really needs this alpha helix bundle to, to form and release a lot of energy for membrane fusion. Uh, and this has been uh, somewhat enig enigmatic, uh, but one suggested candidate was uh, VAMP8. Uh, so we imaged uh, VAMP8, and you can see these uh, VAMP8 uh, vesicles, uh, really quite numerous. And then what was surprising to us was that these perforin vesicles that we imaged separately here in, in red uh, really were uh, distinct from the VAMP8 vesicles. So that was really suggesting that uh, these are two different compartments, uh, and we can see uh, mini VAMP8 uh, vesicles coming in to the, uh, to the interaction phase here, just below the plasma membrane very early on, whereas perforin vesicles take more time uh, to accumulate. And there are also a lot of uh, fluorescence dis uh, dispersion events really suggesting some form of, uh, of vesicle fusion, uh, which were very numerous for the, for the VAMP8 uh, and, and less so for, for the perforin vesicle. So this was suggesting that this is not the true um, um, R snare for the cytoxic granule, uh, but still uh, important for this process as when we knocked out VAMP8. Uh, the exocytosis was, was inhibited. But to really show that uh, these VAMP8 vesicles were fusing, we created a, a, a dual uh, construct here with, uh, with red M cherry uh, lighting up um, in, in the vesicles, and then a pH sensitive dye, which would change uh, um, fluorescence upon, uh, upon exocytosis and, uh, and um, uh, a more uh, or a less uh, acidic uh, extracellular milieu. Uh, and basically what you can see here uh, is that there are a number of, of um, um, points where, where these vesicles flash and change color. Sometimes it's really abrupt, where you see this, uh, this green fluorescence changing very abruptly, with a, consistent with a, a, a rapid release, uh, and sometimes it's more gradual. But basically these small vesicles that we could uh, identify as recycling endosomes come into the plasma membrane um, uh, or the immune synapse and fuse with the plasma membrane prior to any, um, any cytotoxic granules. And they're a prerequisite, uh, among others, carrying a syntaxin 11, this, this uh, uh, snare on the plasma membrane that's required for the subsequent cytotoxic granule release. So, so with this work, we kind of divine, defined a uh, a prerequisite here uh, for these recycling endosomes to fuse with the plasma membrane, uh, bring in syntaxin 11, uh, and thereby uh, form, um, form an acceptor snare complex for the cytoxic granules. Uh, of course, this didn't solve the problem of, of what the R snare uh, truly is for the cytotoxic granule exocytosis. Uh, in uh, mice, uh, VAMP2 has been suggested, but VAMP2 does not seem to be expressed in human uh, lymphocytes. Um, but VAMP7 and, and VAMP8 uh, have been shown to, to, at least in part, mediate this process. But it's still unclear if, if there's one VAMP for this process or if, if VAMP7 and VAMP8, uh, if there's some level of redundancy there. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, another question that's uh, been in the field is really how does MONK 13.4 uh, that, uh, that regulates uh, um, vesicle uh, excitosis, how does it uh, um, uh, do so in, in hematopoietic cells? Uh, and this question really stems from uh, an observation uh, in neurons where uh, the neuronal cells uh, express um, any one of, of uh, three other genes are related to MONK13.4, MONK13.1, 2, and 3 um, that, that mediate the presynaptic release of vesicles. 
And uh, what you can uh, appreciate there is, is Monk 13, 1, 2, and 3 isoforms all have this C1 domain, uh, which uh, the neuroscientists have very nicely shown through a lot of structural work, is crucial for binding the plasma membrane uh, and really forming this bridge between the, uh, the vesicle, so in the, in the lymphocytes, this is the cytoxic granule, uh, where, where they bind lipids on the, on the vesicle and bridge it with the plasma membrane to, to really um, facil facilitate fusion. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, these MUNC13-4 isoforms all lack this N terminus and, and uh, C1 domain. So, so how does MUNC13-4 facilitate docking of vesicles uh, if it's lacking this, this membrane binding um, uh, unit? So uh, here, uh, a few years ago, we were contacted by some uh, Finnish colleagues who had a four-month-old boy presenting with HLH. Uh, and what we found was defective exocytosis and, and lymphocyte cytotoxicity in this individual, really suggesting a, a defect uh, in the uh, exocytic machinery. Uh, however, no mutations were identified in any of the familial HLH-associated genes. In these cases, we're very careful to all, also check uh, protein expression because uh, from our experience, we've, uh, we've uncovered uh, several non-coding mutations that explain uh, more than half of uh, uh, the infant HLH cases in, in Sweden and in the Nordic region. So these are uh, inversions in MUNC13-4, uh, intronic mutations that uh, disrupt um, um, expression of the genes, uh, as well as uh, here in the Baltic area, uh, a kind of atypical uh, Griselli syndrome, uh, RAB27 rearrangement. So this is uh, four families we've identified uh, more now uh, that all uh, carry by allelic um, uh, loss of function variants in RAB27A that, that, uh, that also include this uh, duplication inversion that specifically um, uh, abrogates the, the lymphocyte-specific um, promoter of RAB27A. So they can still uh, express uh, RAB27A in melanocytes and have normal pigmentation, but they, they develop uh, HLH at varying degrees of age, actually often presenting with neurological features uh, well before uh, developing HLH. So you see here uh, sometimes presenting with a neuroinflammation at six years and then developing HLH several years later. So anyway, looking at this uh, Finnish patient, uh, we, we found normal uh, expression of, of all the, the known HLH genes, um, but uh, genetics uh, uncovered a heterozygous, uh, compound heterozygous mutation in rho G, which encodes a small G protein implicated in actin cytoskeletal regulation. Um, so we, of course, we were interested in, in how this new protein uh, uh, could uh, potentially um, interfere with, uh, or, or loss of this could could uh, cause uh, defective lymphocyte cytotoxicity. Uh, this uh, mutation uh, that was identified in the patient is uh, one of them is a is a larger deletion, uh, and the second one is is a missense mutation that reduces protein stability. And knockout of, of rho G uh, also um, uh, interfered with um, NK cell exocytosis. Uh, so, um, uh, and then one could go in and, and rescue uh, exocytosis with, with ectopic expression of, of rho G wild type constructs. Uh, but what I think was a, a very elegant exp uh, um, um, experiment here, if I may say so myself, is is where we knocked out uh, NK92 in, uh, I mean, rho G in NK92 cells, um, and then uh, you can either uh, reconstitute uh, with with wild type rho G, and you get good exocytosis. The truncated um, uh, variant of rho G does not. Uh, but you can also actually put in uh, MUNC13-1, so the neuronal uh, MUNC13, uh, and that also uh, really reconstitutes exocytosis quite well in a, in a hematopoietic cell. If you delete out the N-terminus containing the C1 domain that mediates binding, you get much less exocytosis. So this is really showing how important this, this N-terminal uh, interaction is uh, for, uh, with the membrane for exocytosis. Uh, and uh, then what we could uh, move on and show is that um, 
uh, active forms of, of Rho-G uh, when it's GTP bound uh, bind phosphoinositide lipids uh, more efficiently, uh, and this uh, this binding is particularly augmented by uh, by MONK134. So there's a cooperative binding there between uh, MONK134 and um, and Rho-G. So uh, here we've determined a mechanism of, of regulated excitosis uh, that's uh, likely applicable to an to a array of at least hematopoietic cell types. And, and what's interesting there is, of course, uh, in neurons, uh, ex excitosis is a little more hardwired. You have preformed synapses. Uh, where where exocytosis is is uh, transmitted, but in uh, in immune cells, of course, it has to be much more dynamic because they're constantly uh, trying to gauge for areas uh, where immune synapses are, are formed uh, and then form uh, these uh, these molecular uh, machines for for exocytosis. So so Rho G uh, is a molecule there that can maybe facilitate some more of this dyna dynamics, also facilitating uh, actin remodeling modeling and, and clearing of some of the actin cytoskeleton uh, for, uh, for mediating um, conduits for, for these uh, cytotoxic vesicles. Um, so, so then the question is, is this a novel form of HLH? We certainly have one patient uh, with, uh, with HLH uh, associated with uh, Rho-G deficiency, uh, but that's not, uh, that's not a lot. It's a, a really quite small protein, uh, so maybe uh, uh, you know, we've just missed out um, over the years, uh, but I think we and many other groups have analyzed a really large number of, of um, uh, HLH uh, patients, uh, and, and this is the, the first uh, patient so far that we're, uh, we're aware of. Uh, and what we can note there is, is like perforin deficiency, UNC13D deficiency, uh, unvariably present with HLH within the first years of life. Uh, so with really strong um, associations. Whereas syntaxin 11 deficiency, uh, there is a little more redundancy in the system. It seems like other syntaxins can go in and compensate to some extent, uh, and, and that's mirrored by uh, later, uh, typically later presentations and longer periods of disease-free remission in these patients. So, uh, so I would kind of speculate in, in this uh, row G, maybe representing uh, a, a gene with somewhat lower penetrance uh, than, uh, than these other uh, HLH genes, but uh, definitely important for exocytosis by, uh, by hematopoietic cells. Okay, and then just uh, just over to another story that uh, we we've been working on, just recently submitted. Uh, so this is just an example of a, a later onset HLH patient, a 35-year-old male with a history of recurrent uh, sinopulmonary infections, who initially uh, presented clinically with recur recurrent fever and, and dry coughs. Uh, he had high EBV uh, copy numbers and and really developed a chronic active uh, EBV uh, in, infection that uh, I'm sure many of you know is associated with, with very poor prognosis. Uh, and then he had HLH that uh, repeatedly relapsed. Uh, and unfortunately, after two years, the patient died of pulmonary in insufficiency due to aspergillosis infection in the running up to, uh, to uh, conditioning and, and transplant. Uh, so this was a a uh, family of Moroccan descent, uh, where we found a, a, a rare RAB27A uh, missense variant uh, in a, a very conserved uh, residue. So this R uh, um, or arginine uh, 184 uh, glutamine, and uh, this uh, this patient had RAB27A uh, expression uh, when we ectopically express uh, this uh, this variant in, in uh, fibroblasts, we see good expression relative to a, another truncating variant affecting the same uh, amino acid residue. Um, what was uh, notable here in this patient uh, is that we did not have this hyperpigmentation. Um, so this is just a healthy control and, and, and the patient, whereas in, in typical Griselli um, type 2 patients, you see this accumul accumulation of pigment. Um, but we did see uh, very much reduced uh, exocytosis uh, by the lymphocytes. Um, and, and we know that mutations in RAD27A that selectively impair uh, interactions with MONK134 
uh, have been associated with, with atypical forms that lack hyperpigmentation uh, but, but display HLH. So we went on to, to look at the um, uh, more of the function of these variants, uh, first by reconstituting uh, RAB27A deficient melanocytes, uh, and there uh, we saw that uh, the, the variant uh, did uh, reconstitute um, uh, pigmentation to a similar extent as, as wild type. Uh, but then when we put these variants uh, or uh, transduce them into uh, CD8 T cells from Griselli um, uh, syndrome type 2 patients so lacking RAB27A, uh, you can see that uh, you, uh, uh, whereas uh, wild type induces more exocytosis, the, the um, patient-derived variant does not. Uh, so there, there we find uh, a clear defect. But when we started looking at the protein interactions, um, we, we found that melanophilin binding, uh, so, so uh, the uh, effector in, in melanocytes, that interaction was, was intact uh, in between wild type and, and, uh, uh, and the mutated uh, protein variant. Whereas um, uh, for, for two of the other hematopoietic interactors, it looked somewhat different. So we saw a, a mild uh, reduction um, of, uh, of the interaction with um, SLIP 2A. Uh, but then, um, I'm sorry, the, the dots are, uh, disappeared here. But with the, with the um, uh, MONK 13.4 that's critical for exocytosis, we actually saw that this patient-derived variant had increased binding. Uh, and uh, when we uh, coupled this to, to variants that, that mimic the inactive form uh, of RAB27A, we see that they have extremely uh, high binding. So, uh, so this seems to be a, a novel form of a dysregulated um, um, RAB27A um, uh, deficiency, uh, but where we really don't quite understand the full genetics because uh, this is a, a biallelic, uh, um, or the patient is homozygous for this variant, uh, and if, if this binding is so strong, one could even suspect that maybe uh, dominant uh, effects would be uh, apparent in, in um, carriers. But, uh, but that's, uh, that's what we've learned so far from, from this family at least. Okay, so, so uh, I think uh, where we are in the HLH field is uh, we know there are very strong associations to defects in cytotoxicity um, and, and where uh, excessive interferon gamma uh, release uh, is, is one of the hallmarks and, and one of the current targets for, for therapy. But then with, uh, with high throughput sequencing, we've learned a lot more where many other defects uh, are also associated with, uh, with uh, development of, um, uh, of HLH. And, and some of these uh, fall much more within the realm of uh, autoinflammation um, with, uh, with activating mutations, particularly in NLRC4, which give uh, very much excessive IL-18. And then, of course, IL-18 can induce a lot of interferon gamma that, that fits the whole um, cytokine spectrum of, of HLH. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, on the other hand, one has a lot of immunodeficiencies um, with, uh, with uh, uh, impaired pathogen control, particularly of viruses, uh, and where uh, if you get a lot of um, damps, they can also induce uh, HLH-like phenotypes. And we know that uh, just uh, repetitive uh, administration of TLR ligands uh, in, um, in healthy uh, wild-type mice can induce a macrophage activation HLH-like phenotype, nicely shown by, by Ed Behrens. So, so here the really question for the field now is, is how should one uh, potentially distinctly treat uh, these, uh, these patients? Should they uh, all have interferon gamma therapy or might it be better to also target more of the innate uh, immune system in some of these patients with ruxolitinib, for example? So with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and, and also particularly thank uh, the uh, the individuals who did the uh, work, uh, both in my lab and, and through uh, some very nice and fruitful collaborations with colleagues at many other different centers. So thank you.